I think Corey and Franz, other guys have probably got ideas on that as well. Roger. Is it up? You feel most of the pain up in the high hip, like where the it, yeah, where right, it, right at that rectus femoris attachment. Not yay. So I like using the monkey foot, or yeah, I got one to pump a lot of blood in there. You talking about like hip raises? Yeah. 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 Um, those, get, I know, do those once a pop, week uh, for like eighty big, reps. High, high, high reps, like pump a bunch of blood into that <laughs> that area. Yeah, and then. I've had I've done that and then used manual therapy to break that tissue up. Like thumbs exactly, break getting in there. It's get someone else to do it. <laughs> okay. Because you're not going to get deep enough to to do it, right? Bringing the blood into the area will loosen up the tissue in and of itself and help heal whatever's going on there. And then I I totally agree with Keegan about the uh, reverse Nordics, but feet elevated, it's an aggressive move. Like even, even, you know, I have a guy is similar issue and I put a couple of pads up on my Nordic bench and then have him go, uh, feet up on those pads and then just lean back into that position. He only moves like two or three inches, oh. but the key is to get the butt in between the heels. And, and it's about how much tension can you handle in that position. And you don't want to it's, force it's challenging. It's, it feels like the cutting edge of what I'm capable of right now to get that far into it. So. Yeah, that's, that's why I think Keegan was saying, don't, don't go into the full reverse. Because I don't even think that's beneficial with what you're dealing with at all in any way. And then the couch stretch may be difficult for you to do, but sitting back on your heels with your feet elevated, you will immediately get a referral of tension in, in, in your, your quad. And probably up in that high hip. And you just want to avoid that kind of electric Terry feeling yeah. that you're getting. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of hot. It's almost like a, a hot needle stuck in yep. the tissue there. Yep. Yeah. And, and then as that begins to dissipate, move a little bit further into the, the move, you know, the, the position. Not necessarily the movement, right? Because you're at the, where you're at, you're not going to be moving a lot. But the monkey foot for those high hip anterior stuff that you got going on is money dude like working the hip flexor yeah that's that's, cool. awesome. that's a great tip that's that's uh, yeah. definitely something that should be added to that conversation thank you jason thanks jason good Corey, did you have something you wanted to add there you got your hand up on the uh very patient oh yeah Right, it's cool. Yeah, it wasn't specific to Adam's issues. Uh, okay, it was okay. just a question that I had, so I don't. I don't want. Well, maybe to... um, I, if I can give Dylan like thirty seconds there, because I know he's deep into the manual therapy side of things. If Adam's still there, everyone else is listening. Anyway, I don't know where if Adam's lost his but... Oh, did he step up? Oh, there he is. Here he goes. Yeah, t tell us something about the uh, the manual therapy side of this, Dylan, because I know you're you're uh, deep in that world. Yeah, so if, uh, if that insertion point there at the hip, uh, if that's a very, that's an area you want to get in deep. Um, if you have access to a barbell, you can take the end of it and just sit down, long sit, put it right there. It might be a little sharp because of the leverage of the barbell. So it, it's 45 pounds, but that leverage will be a lot of pressure. So you might want to put a blanket or a towel over it. Um, if you want to go a little lighter, you can get a kettlebell and flip it upside down so that the, the handle is kind of a bar and you just can kind of rest in there. Try to hold it for like 60 seconds. Um, that, that's a great way to kind of help diffuse that tissue and loosen it up. Try to get your whole quad and uh, that TFL. Uh, yeah. Those those are some of my go-tos. So, Thank you. Can I really, using the monkey foot before you do any of that stuff is going to make it feel a lot less aggressive like getting 100%. that activated warmed up um before you apply pressure to it is going to make it feel a lot better you're going to get a lot more travel for your manual therapy um what else did you you mention oh and i don't know what your split squat looks like um but especially for this this high hip stuff um, make sure that front foot is elevated and that back leg is straight as a board. And, and it, yeah, I got my first, I got my first KOT lunge today, actually, um, with my heel 
like maybe a half of an inch from my butt with two riser rungs on the riser. So that's the best I've ever been able to do. I even had a little bit of weight in there. So things are coming along actually pretty damn well in that regard. With that hip, I wouldn't force it. I would just more like inform it that like, hey, this straight leg um, in, the, in the posterior position, we're okay. We're, we're good. And actually when you're down in the, the bottom of the split squat, making sure that you're taking full diaphragmatic breaths into the bottom of the canister, right? Will inform that tissue even more. So a lot of times people don't understand that you can use the breath to get into the corners of stretch, especially in the hips. And if you're breathing below the chest, right? Which many of us don't do, but if you pelvic can, floor type of breathing you're talking about, right? Right. Well, if you imagine the, 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 the body as like a canister, right. And in, in both positions, all the air out and all the air in, you will get a referral into that, that quad tendon. All right. into your, and all that's because all that anterior tissue is important for how well you are able to open up the belly, right. As you take a full breath. Right? So it will push down into it. It's kind of like that last little piece of tissue that the breath will like boop, work in there. So thank you for the advice. I'll take it for sure. Absolutely. The good thing about putting a question to a group of coaches is, you know, you're going to get <laughs> suggestions on suggestions. There's like eight links there for you as well, Adam, in the, in the chat box, if you get a chance. Checking these out right now. Much appreciated. Thank you. Maybe someone can archive them for us so we can put them together with the recording of the chat. Maybe Max is good at jobs like that. <laughs> My right could, hand I, could I chime in with one more uh, perspective? Yeah, on yeah. That? I was getting to you there, Brennan. Good. What do you, what do you go for oh. us there? Um, so, Adam, not to complicate it too much, but it was interesting when you pointed out the knee valgus too and the step up. I had a, a similar situation with. I thought it was hip flexor tendonitis, and I was also getting some bit of like impingement in the bottom of a squat. And the more I became researched into it and looking up that hip area, there's a lot of times like a mirage of symptoms. So not only does it get really uh, inflamed and, and start to feel bad in the short range with like that hip flexor specifically, but that internal rotation gets worse and worse for a lot of people. And if you have knee valgus on a step up, when that's not, you know, too demanding of the hip stabilizers is a little bit. Um, I would maybe test, like, do you have the same on the left side to right side on, on getting no. that feet to the no. ground? No, nope, so it's only that, on the right side. Right. That, that's where I was at, that I was looking at it isolated of just hip flexor, and I was hammering away with, I mean, the blood flow stuff is great always, and getting a lot of volume there, and also the loaded stretch and the ATG split squat. But for me, the thing that really completely transformed it for me was the seated good morning and lengthening out adductors and starting to actually get a lot better with um with the hip not just from the anterior side but all around and that's actually a common thing with like post sports hernia surgery or hip flexor strains and surgeries is they actually clip the adductor to lengthen it because when the hip gets tight in the front a lot of times it pulls inward too yeah. Um, I didn't want to yeah. over worth mentioning worth mentioning Brennan that uh, I had in my uh, right uh, hamstring tendon grafted into a new ACL about six years ago. And I also had a meniscectomy surgery about two years ago. And I think when you when you're on crutches for a long time, you know, cumulatively, probably a year of crutches between those two surgeries. Um, I, um, your foot tends to turn outwardly kind of as like a compensatory club to help you walk better. And I think your knee tends to kind of like turn inward just to kind of like, you know, when you're starting to get like, um, your gait again. And I feel like I'm still kind of like working my way out from underneath some of the accommodations my body was making from those surgeries. Um, yeah. And granted, I've been doing HEG for about seven months and things are on the up and up in a huge way. These are like my last couple small gripes basically right. at this point so that's great yeah it's just i know it's frustrating to like keep hammering away at where it's painful and it's not you know breaking through and sometimes it can be like it can be right on the other side of of something you didn't realize i always wondered wow the side that my hip was bad also had really bad uh 
my hip flexor was bad on that side. I had bad internal rotation and I had a pelvic shift when I was squat and it was just stuff that I didn't really put together. And so, you know, that's just, that's my experience. I relate a lot to what you're talking about. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Brandon, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Can I jump in a second on the, on, on this whole thing, especially the foot turned out and everything. Yeah, Jason. Um, I'm, do you have a lot of tension in the bottom of your foot? Like in the I roll arch? it out with a lacrosse ball and sometimes the arch itself, maybe the midfoot itself carry above average tension, but I think I have really healthy feet. I wear Vivos. I run in Vivos. Um, I've been told that I, I have mechanically healthy feet. I use, uh, these correct toes, toe spacers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, to yeah. get rid of my final bunion on my big toe yeah. joint. I have good spacing, <laughs> good healthy feet. I'm, t- I'm taking good care. So good, man. Let it let us know how you get on with this, Adam. Maybe even, you know, maybe we'll see something within a week. Max is you got his is that bottle top, Max? Or yeah, these were my... amazing. I I chrome <laughs> in my toes like all the time when I'm just standing. That's doing the work. DIY method, dude, right there. Save yourself 50 bucks. <laughs> I'm bummed I didn't okay. get the purple ones i ordered them and i i got like the clear white lame ones like so lame, I boring <laughs> Corey uh, the gel ones from um the foot collective are a bit cheaper just letting you know they're not less aggressive too yeah yeah i was in so much pain the first two weeks i put these babies on i actually wrote them a nasty email and was like you guys gave me the wrong size and they were like actually we gave you the right size be fucking patient. And I did be patient and now I'm in good shape. So <laughs> listen to correct toes. Let's go to Texas. What have you go for us there? Oh yeah. Um, so I have, now that we've been talking about with Adam stuff, mine's two part. Um, if from my understanding, if someone's knee is going dropping inward in that valgus position, it, that's the the VMO is is kind of responsible for that, right? So strengthening the VMO would help with the valgus knee. This would be the I've I've seen uh, Ben be asked about like Samoa, like Island Pacific Islander athletes, which I worked with a lot of those guys in rugby, and often you do see those like legs that are collapsed in, and he put it down to power to weight ratio like they get heavy young and they don't necessarily have the strength to deal with that heaviness and so they get that kind of collapsing and and uh yeah his experience was like reversing that collapsing um through strengthening those muscles um i'd imagine it's slow but if you look at the kind of changes that we're talking about inside of the knee joint and the knee surface and the actual um you know the acl ligament potentially becoming you know thicker stronger then there's no reason why you couldn't see those kind of changes as well. And as you guys are saying with your feet, you know, like serious structural change is, is possible. And I, I've seen this with my feet as well. Like, so, you know, why not also for the, for the valgus, but yeah, that's, I've definitely heard uh, Ben speaking about that. I'm not sure if other people can speak to experience of uh, reversing valgus. Well, having, my- uh, seeing a change there. The, the valgus knee is, I always look at the foot first. Like, is that arch collapsing? Because if the arch of the foot is collapsing, or if you're mildly flat footed, so one of the first things I thought about, and I can't remember what the gentleman's name with the high hip problem is, it has slipped my mind, but Adam, the, um, uh, Adam, um, Keegan brought up Huddle's um, foot stuff, and one of the main exercises is the um, arch builders like where you lift up the arch of the foot and you kind of externally rotate the knee at when you do that a little bit, it goes into external rotation. I think and it's I, called short foot. What was that? It's called short foot. When you build yeah. an arch by like placing your toes down, spacing them out and trying to lift the arch. Yeah. When you were talking about foot up, right? Issue. That's the first thing that came to mind when Keegan mentioned Graham Tuttle. I think that that's, it, it, but then if you're the arch of your foot is fine, you, you, you're definitely looking up chain, right? Which is what um, the guy from Texas was saying. I, I can't remember everybody's name. Corey. <laughs> Corey. Corey. Yeah. Right. Are you on your phone? If you're on the computer, you can set it so you can see everybody's names. Yeah, but if, but if you're on the phone, I don't know if you can do that. I guess you can't. Yeah, it's a bit trickier. 
Yeah. yeah, I, I uh, was, I had that Valgus thing and I still kind of do, but um, with the step ups, I sent a video from the Zach Woodward to really help me like try to track my knee outwards just to start getting into the step ups and get the VMO firing. And now my VMOs are like evening out and I can tell there's just way less pain. Um, and then I remember watching an old podcast with Ben and Keegan and they were talking about like glute mead work. And Ben basically said that he did like, you know, all of the lateral band walks, the clamshells, and he lived that whole life of like, you know, trying to target the glute meat or like target the hip or whatever. And he's like, Paul Quinn said, you know, standing, the standing athlete should do standing exercises. So like the step up is going to be the king, like, and, and that's how I've been thinking about it. So I've been doing extra step ups for everything and it's, it's working uh, really well for me. So Max, in your opinion, getting just tons of high volumes of step ups, feeling kind of wobbly and uneven slowly over the course of time, it's going to self correct by virtue of just tons of volume is what you're saying. I would say like, try to make it as like, I would look in the mirror and like make each rep like identical. That's what I did. And to do it on my bad leg, I had to actually put some pressure. Like if this was my foot, I'd actually put some pressure on my pinky side. So I had to, I know we're trying to go on the big toe. Like ultimately that's the goal, but like I had to actually lean my foot and my pressure that way to track my knee outwards. I don't know if that no, makes yeah. sense. One of my favorite so, trainers, Megan Calloway, she talks about like a tripod effect, like the first metatarsal, the fifth metatarsal, and kind of like your heel sides as the rudders. And there should be, you know, like shifting weight, depending on what you're doing in those, in those areas, if that relates to what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really know any of the stuff about it, but that's just, I guess what worked. <laughs> yeah. I had a, uh, just to, just to break in here is, uh, I had, I had some of the same, uh, issues when I was coming off my, uh, I have no ACL in my left knee and, and a meniscus tear and coming off to, uh, to rehab there, I have some of the same issues that I tend to be very wobbly when I started out and, and carving in, in that valgus position. But it, just like Max said, actually here at the last part, uh, what fixed me was actually pushing down with my pinky, uh, pushing it down into the ground and actually look at my knee and travel, uh, the knee, through the mid toes right so make every rep perfect and make perfect reps your repetitions so repetition is king and 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 then using that actual moment uh, actual moment uh, motion and and just perfecting it and i like i like uh, ben talking about using the perfect rep and going for that so i would i would make a ton of those uh, well said, Torben. Well said, Max. Thanks, you too. And then uh, just real quick to follow on that, uh, my initial question, Keegan, was more of a clarification when referencing, uh, I mean, I get the concept of long range, short range, and mid range, but when you say inner and outer, are those, are those meaning something different? Uh, I, just, I just needed a, just a quick clarification on that. Did I, uh, did I say inner and outer then? I, we used to, uh, when we first path. were talking yeah. about the concept, we, were talk, we did talk about it as inner and outer range because yeah, sometimes people talk about strength like that, but then we found that it was really confusing with like um, adductors and things like that. People would think like inner thigh and outer thigh and you know, then it was just like, oh, that's not going to work. So we started talking about short and long range. Um, but there is some talk of like inner in the split stuff. So, um, but that was referring to like inner thigh, but I'm not sure if I said it before when we we're talking about the triceps or something, did I? Or? Um, I honestly, I not, not that I can recall on this call. Um, just, just some of the stuff that I've been listening to over the past, you know, few weeks. Um, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything and confusing something with, with something else. Yeah. In the, I, in the I don't think I've caught myself saying that for, for a year or so, but maybe uh, it might have slipped through. I don't know. But yeah, it was probably 
you know, you know, old YouTube video or something. Um, I've watched. Yeah, yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Some of the older stuff we we were talking about it like that. So yeah, if you if you see it, I like I'm happy. To, you know, let me know and I can take it down because it's like I don't know. I, sh- I should go back through and order all that stuff. But cool, fair enough. I think, just it, to check. I think it was in like uh, the Athletic Range YouTube series or the the yeah. Athletic Secrets on the YouTube. But the way it was described, I'm pretty sure it was the same concept like long range is outer and short range is inner range you just think of it conceptually i guess like that but it wasn't confusing in the video but i guess i could totally see how that would be yeah yeah it confused me for a while because we kept like everyone was confused by the concept and then i think once we went to short and long that that made a lot more intuitive sense because we're talking about the tissue length rather than inner and outer doesn't like it kind of speaks to medial and lateral so anyways so um, the concept, yeah, the concept is good. Once you get the hang of it, um, you can kind of customize anything and understand what you're looking for in a movement. I was just, just to finish on Corey's one there, like the, I actually played around with going into Valgus on step ups and found that like that really can hit the VMO pretty hard as well. Like that's kind of the, I guess the opposite way of looking at what you guys are talking about. I don't know if anyone played around with that. I, I was doing a bunch of that um while i was on sark and it's 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 almost along that idea of like stressing the tissues in their direction that they're going to injure like poliquin step ups and peterson step ups you're, you're sort of like gently breaking your acl like you're doing it at a slow speed and with a low enough weight that nothing snaps but like you're putting tension into those tissues you know so I found that, yeah, I actually kind of liked it, like just really light and just um, just feeling the positions just to feel like, I guess, Edo Portal kind of pushed at the world in that direction a little bit of like, there aren't any bad positions. They're just bad people that tell you to avoid positions um, that, you know, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, like you wouldn't load it up super heavy and go for like, okay, like body weight on the back. Let's go for 10 of these as far as you can get into Valgus. But um, um Reflections there. I think Franz is kind of in that world a little bit, maybe. If you got any thoughts. Yeah, I, I mean, especially with like the Velgus jump, this is something I find interesting because it's still, I see a lot of discussion around this one as many high jumpers or vertical jumpers are running into a really strong Velgus position before they take off. And you can also see it with most natural jumpers, people that don't adhere to certain technique, especially in putting. When they run, especially with a lateral block, you need the hip internal rotation to laterally block into the ground. If you don't use this one, all the load will go through the outside of the knee and then likely like stress. I had it when training like side flips excessively and didn't blocking with a lot of internal rotation, just blocking sideways. Then my outside of the knee was flaring up a lot. So I think the whole concept of conditioning this position, moving it slowly, is a good idea especially with the vmo being more active in the knee in position so i always got like an amazing burn through my vmo before knowing the patrick step ups with these vulgar squats but then if you have a lot of knee problems how do you scale it back and make it accessible yeah yeah that's the like you don't want to just tear everybody into them but maybe they have a use for some people especially like parkour lovers and you know wacky movement lovers like uh like france you know it's worth worth considering did you have something there dylan uh yeah um it's a separate topic um but i've been re-watching the video that you put on your youtube channel about the truth about stretching and it's a short video, but I'm, so I'm still trying to really wrap my head around it. But you explained that stretching should really be seen as a low grade isometric, um, if I said that correctly. And if so, um, is it a isometric for the muscle being stretched or the one pulling you into that stretched position like hip flexor versus your hamstring when you're trying to touch your toes. That makes sense. <laughs> be cool to hear from other guys on this one because I've kind of given my opinion a little bit. I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on this straight up. Uh, yeah, I I can see if I can re- 
regurgitate that in the way I understood it. Um, so I always thought it was for the muscle being stretched. So like if you're doing the like elephant walks or something, it's like it's like doing a Jefferson curl without the weight and the weight is just your upper body. So that isometric, as I understand it, is that muscle trying not to tear. So it's it's still sort of being fired so that you don't just like and just like fall the way down. So it's still being used in the way that it's preventing you from falling all the way down. And so, I mean, in that process, it's like slowly being lengthened and the tendons are slowly being lengthened. But um, yeah, that isometric I think you're talking about is it almost like preventing itself from just snapping, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. I, um... I had a client recently, I just massaged him, but he was big time football player and everything. And it was kind of weird. Um, he told me, he's like, yeah, I got, I've gotten x-rays in like my shoulders. And the doctor said like, oh, your joints are just so deep that you just don't get, you're not going to have the range of motion. It's like, and he, and he was telling him like, I, they're telling the doctor that I stretch all the time. Like, why can't I get these? And the doctor's like, it's your joints. You can't move in those positions. And I'll admit, because of Ben Patrick, my BS alarm kind of went off because uh, I noticed that his pecs were very well developed, but his rotator cuff, when I got to there, was like almost non-existent. So I'm like, of course, you know, your pecs are going to always overpower yourself. You're never going to be able to externally rotate too much if your rotator cuff is super freaking weak. Um, so I'm hoping uh, when I get fully started on the ATG program, um, we're going to start building some of that external rotation again, hopefully at least, at least a little bit. Um, so I just kind of saw like about the whole isometric, um, low grade isometrics. I was kind of thinking to myself, uh, he probably was always just static stretching. And since he was such a big, tough guy, he probably could have gotten some better range of motion if he had done loaded stretch like Jefferson curls, like what we have in ATG. I just wanted to see if I was kind of on the right, right track with that. Yeah, I, I, I've noticed in the past, like, I, I mean, I'm not the biggest dude, but um, from playing soccer for a long time, I've never really been able to get much progress of anything through just static stretching. Like, I did a lot of elephant walks for a long time, and it was, I ended up in the same place as I was before. But then a couple of weeks of Jefferson curls or, and a little bit of, like, good mornings, and, uh, that made the biggest impact and I think that's just because the more muscle mass you have the longer it kind of takes to break those down enough that you can get into those ranges and create that adaptation um so yeah I mean I've loved the weight of stretching has anyone heard the the idea that uh when someone's in a coma their their body will kind of move into any position I'm getting an odd there from Franz so what that tells me is that it's the nervous system. So when you train with strength and when you train with load, like because the strength is the focus rather than just this position hurts and your body's getting into and out of the position and it's using force in the position, then to me, it's just more so like, it's like you're wearing this safety sensor suit under your skin, like which could be the fascia and it's like the warning light goes off whenever you get to a position that's like, um, we're not really familiar with this. This is like danger zone. So the alarm goes off and you stop, you know, like the brakes go on. So all you do with these movements is like show the body. No, we can go there. We can get back. We can go there. We can get back. Like there's no issue here. Like just give me this, you know, give me the ability to use this. Um, I've found with people, like if you do like slant board Jefferson curls, like with like CrossFit guys or guys that have done a bunch of training and don't have bad backs. If you go like 20 kilos, 30 kilos, you know, 20 kilos, 40 kilos, 60 kilos, something like that. And like a Zercha slant board Jefferson, by the time they're doing 60 kilos, they're getting like elbows touching their feet, <laughs> um, like or, or close to it. Like you get like this really fast gain in range. And it's kind of dumb and it's kind of risky to do that, but it shows like the body will just give it to you if you if you kind of ask for it with with those kind of weights, especially this the this the uh the slam board Jefferson is especially because it's like there's so much fascia to to kind of respond to the movement. It's like over many joints um that you kind of it's it's got a lot of room to give kind of thing. 
but um yeah i think once you have those kind of experiences you're just like the way of just sitting around stretching for a long time like cool if you love it but very few people love it like for those who love it fantastic like power to you it's just to me it's just like doing a thousand reps instead of doing 10 reps to to get a result like but you know you need to if you go too far with it, like I definitely get too carried away with a sledgehammer and then like you can like light up all the fascia in the lower back and stuff by, you know, by getting too wacky with, with carried away with these like slam board Jeffersons. And I've done it to myself. Like, so that's good because I know how to warn people about it. Um, and it's, you know, it's okay if you do that as a coach, but don't do it to your NBA player or NFL player when he comes to train with you or don't do it to grandma. Um, but yeah, like the, for the pack, like, people talk about the trap three rays and all that stuff. Like it's, it's the tightness in the front that's messing everything up in my experience for, for most guys, because they've done a shitload of bench press. They can't dip to depth. They can't do flies. They can't snatch. They can't pre- press behind the neck. So how the hell are they going to have um, a trap three position? Like there's no possibility. It's not weakness in the trap three. It's that the shoulder is never going anywhere near that position, even with no weight because of the tension in the front. So same as the kind of conversation we're having with Adam, like you got to take the tension out before you can hope to get that really good inner range. If you think about it, the trap three is really an inner range trap exercise, which means it's going to be poor for hypertrophy. Um, it's going to cause you know less tissue damage. It's going to be kind of a slow responder and it's going to need high repetitions. Um, where if you look at something like the power raise, that's more of like a long range, a middle to long range posterior delt exercise where most posterior delt exercise that people do when they're doing like reverse flies, then they tend to be more of a short range exercise, which is not going to cause as much muscle growth, which is part of the reason why guys have shit posterior delts is, you know, and Pollock can change that. So um, yeah, once you, once you get all these frameworks, then it just, you can just plug it all into the whole, you know, you plug it into the shoulder, but the concept of like the joints too deep in the shoulder that's, 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 um, that's a new one for me. Like I, I've heard it. I mean, you hear it around the AC stopping people pressing behind the neck. Like Eric Cressy was pushing that message and he's like the world guru on shoulders. Now he works for the Yankees. He was telling people that you have a shoulder joint designed. That's not designed to press behind the neck. That was his message on T nation in, uh, you know, 2005 or something. I don't know whether he's gone back on that, but the research is now clear that, you know, everyone can, the, the shoulder joint will remodel those processes, the chromium process or whatever it is, those coracoid process, or whichever one it is, one of them is going to move out of the way if you keep hanging and you keep pressing behind the neck. And, um, but yeah, I was that guy. I couldn't press behind the neck. I couldn't snatch. I played hockey, like fully hunched kind of posture and I had to work hard to be able to, to snatch safely and, um, I snatched unsafely for years before I snatched safely because I didn't have the knowledge that you guys have, you know, on your side. But yeah, that's why we've got a good job to do, especially in the you know CrossFit community. And if you get these pieces in place, like they're important conversations, but like we've all got our job to play and taking them to different different corners and different areas. Like, I, I yeah, think for that. The more the more drastic the more drastic an issue is, the the less gradual and gentle the intervention is probably going to be. I mean, if you have years of bench pressing over 100 kilos and and that's led to whatever internal rotation and pec minor tightness, five pounds of trap raises just can't be expected to do that. That's like trying to to take down a boulder with a toothpick instead of a jackhammer. It's like you gotta. For me, game changers are heavy loaded dips for range putting the same intensity and intention just towards where you're lacking. I mean, that's, it's, it's interesting that doctors are like quick to jump in with that kind of uh, fragile approach. I don't know, but. Yeah. I, I did see that as weird. It's just like, they, like he tried to show him a little bit, like I only had a couple minutes to talk to him uh, about just the shoulder, but just like just taking an x-ray and like, Oh, now I know exactly how you move there kind of seems like a weird thing to do i feel like we should really test deeper and rather than just like telling him like you're never gonna be that flexible or mobile because of your joint like i just kind of seem not, not trying to be distress, disrespectful to anyone it just seemed like the wrong approach to me but i'm not yeah 
and and I mean it's probably it's not ill intentioned. It's also hard to educate a patient within that thirty minutes together of everything if if that doctor has even come across that exposure, you know, and way of looking at it. So can't blame them, but yeah, it's missing. Let's see which Sometimes it's like black magic that you get from uh, certain medical professionals. And they can say that. I was trying to pull up that video of Jason. So sorry about that. I goofed it. So I I saw that like 10 years ago is what it says on the thing. And when you were talking about the nervous system holding people back from stretching, they are actually doing, um, they put this guy under anesthesia and if you watch the video, it is intense. They stretch him out. It's crazy. I can't remember who it is, but he's like a uh, NFL guy. Yeah. Jason, do you know why they were putting him on anesthesia to stretch? Was he just that tight or... Was there another reason? Yeah, because he like ATG wasn't around yet. <laughs> I I, w- when somebody told me about this, I was like, no way. Uh, and all I can, you know, when I looked at it several years ago, what I was thinking about was like how I, I wonder how the guy felt after the procedure. But if you watch this all the way through, I mean, it's he's a big dude. He's probably, yeah, he's, he plays for the Buccaneers. He's probably close to 300 pounds. And they got two guys who are about my size, 220. Look at the size of that dude. Stretching him all over the place. The human body is not as fragile as we sometimes think. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so his, like, you know, mind-body connection, his brain's checked out and no resistance right so this would be a completely just a physical stretch and there's there's not going to be any neurological education or stoppages to right. well if you guys going. if you guys are familiar with uh philip who's one of the new coaches here in in san jose and i actually just went and saw him yesterday and did some of the ais stretching he's working on my neck and my shoulder this is like what he does on crack well on anesthesia sounds like fun yes <laughs> watch this that is intense man so it's since he's not aware he can't fight or resist is that i mean is that kind of the premise that's the idea just- yeah how do they know? I mean, I mean, I guess that, and that makes kind of sense, but I mean, how do they know they're not going to do any irreparable damage? I mean, I guess, I don't know. It just kind of seems kind of, kind of scary. I don't know, but it speaks to what Keegan was saying about the nervous system or the brain, you know, which is the computer of the nervous system saying like, you know, you got Golgi, Golgi tendon organs and all that mm. stuff that blah, 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 blah. Right. All the stuff we learned in NASA, <laughs> but you shut off the computer and uh, looks like you have free reign to do whatever you want with the joints. So that, I mean, that going back to kind of the nervous system thing, that almost seems like it wouldn't be as effective because you're not breaking through that kind of nervous system, like mm-hmm. stoppage. Cause you're, I mean, it seems like he probably had that range of motion already. They might've getting a little bit on it, but if, if he wakes up and, that block is still there. Like they're not going to have made any progress. If you look at, if you look at some of the research of like what happens with the subconscious mind under anesthetic, there's like some evidence that you actually have perfect recall of what happens on some level. So we're getting a bit into the esoteric there, but there's uh maybe there's, there's some awareness there that, but yeah, it's um, probably beyond the scope of the conversation, but it, it is really interesting research to look at like whether the mind is actually able to be turned off and which parts turn off. And yeah, some people can have full recall on anesthetic um, in certain with yeah, certain methods to 
reattached to that. So it's potentially also being recorded, but yeah, I dare say there's no, uh, no real hard evidence on that, but I'm with you, Matt. Like, I mean, we're not going to be putting people on an anesthetic anyway. It's just to illustrate the point of like, um, it's mostly, it's mostly the software that we need to think about more so than actually changing the hardware and the tissues. Like that's, there's not that much evidence that the tissues, like the tissue changes are very difficult to track. I think you will see tissue changes. I think like RDLs and things like that, like when you're really hard pulling on the muscle, like it makes sense to me that the body is going to lay down more collagen within the hamstring muscle um, as a response to that, as well as make the tendon stronger just because I believe in the intelligence of, of the body and that, you know, it's designed to adapt and to, you know, we're here because it works. We're not here because it doesn't work. Um, so the body's going to do what's smart based on the stimulus that, that it's, you know, experiencing. Um, but oh, yeah. Wow. The, and those procedures are actually pretty common post uh, joint replacement. So I worked at a physical therapy clinic and there was a guy that had a total knee replacement and they did the same thing and they literally just cranked his knee because that last bit of knee bend is sometimes, some, sometimes tough. And he didn't do too well after that. It was a week or two of soreness to where he really sat around and did nothing. And we got better progress just from getting into loaded mobility. And then that, yeah. and it's like, yeah, it's kind of scary. That happens a lot, I think. You got to look at the, the structure of the knee joint though as well. Like I think doing that at the hips and shoulders would potentially be better than you doing that at the knee, you're crunching on. Like that's the magic of ATG as well. Is like, there is something different about knees. Now I, I was just looking for that short long range thing for tendons. So that seemed like the big thing for me, but actually like one of the pieces I just wrote for the book that Ben and I are doing is like the joint dominant exercises and if, and looking at, what the impact is on the joint and the magic, some of the magic of the ATG system is really very specialized to the knee because the knee is the only joint that has so much, um, you know, hard white tissue that provides the, the structure and stability, like with the, the two cruciate ligaments, as well as all the, all the meniscus, like there's so much stuff in there compared to the other joints. Um, so the ATG system, like push, like that, like challenges those tissues more than any other system. And it's like, yeah, it's not spoken about in the language, but that's what's going on. And that's why even though step hops are short range, they're like really strong remodeling exercises. And that was like baffling me because Ben said it to me a couple of times, like, yeah, your short long range thing, like just sort of little like with him because because of the step up, he's like, the step up is key. I know it's, I know it's key, but it's short range. So like it's not a key remodeling exercise. The trick is it's not a key remodeling exercise for the muscle, but it is for the joint because you're almost sliding that tibia, you know, under the, under the fibula, uh, under the femur, you know, you're almost pulling the joint apart and therefore you keep almost pulling the joint apart and that joint learns how to hold itself together real tight. Um, but then the short long range stuff applies to like the health of the muscle and tendon, like universally across the body. Um, and, and muscle hypertrophy and tissue damage and collagen deposition within the muscle, all that stuff. Like I'll stand behind that a thousand percent, but without the joint dominant concept, like the, the, the step ups didn't fit in there. And I knew that there was something wrong with that because the, the Peterson and the Pat, uh, the Poliquin, especially like they definitely can, they're, they're risky. Like they're definitely, um, they're definitely fairly, fairly aggressive. Um, there's something going on there. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think about the the Patrick step as a kind of remodeling for the ankle, going to get in that extra range in there? Because it's something I added back in. Because I mean, I still have some ankle issues, but I added that back in a little bit heavier to try and, I mean, open it up, but kind of close that. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I, hundred percent, like you can look at it from that perspective of like maybe the split squats fine in terms of muscle strength. It's fine in terms of everything, but if the, like the inferior tib fig ligament can get smashed up by split squats, you know, like the, um, the anterior inferior tib fib, the one that holds the tib and fib together, like you can, you can piss that off with, with split squats and people will talk about that pain coming on with split squats. 
So that's the, like the joint is the limiting factor. It doesn't matter how much weight you can move. If the joint can't handle it, then that needs to be like, and, and in the hierarchy, like the joint needs to stand above the muscle where in, in we've all come from weightlifting backgrounds and strength training is based on, you know, powerlifting, weightlifting, kettlebells, whatever it is, where it's like, did you move it from A to B? Okay, well, the job's done. Where we need to think about, did the joint, handle this is this going to make the joint better or is this going to make the joint worse that needs to stand at a higher hierarchical you know um it's more important than whether we can move from a to b so if the joint is like getting a bit pissed off um but yeah that 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 ankle joint 100 you can get some serious remodeling in the bottom of the split squat um and on the patricks if you you know if you're maxing them out um, but yeah, like there tends to be less stuff going on on those joint surfaces and stuff. Like it's much less common to have like degeneration on the, you know, in those, in those areas where the knee it's like super common, but, um, yeah, you could, you can look at it through the same lens. It's just rarer, like same for the elbow, like, cause you don't have all the cruciates and everything in the elbow, like the elbow is the knee, but the elbow doesn't have all that stuff in there. And so you don't have to worry about it. It doesn't, it doesn't show up anywhere near as much, but yeah, it still kind of works for like bench presses and powerlifters who have like cranked up elbows, like to apply a similar, but you want to think more about the rotational stuff at the elbow, which we don't, you know, that that's, um, yeah, it can get wacky, but yeah, the, the principles kind of hold up. Guys, I think uh, I think Ben's not joining us, and I think uh, that's uh, the time we're booked in for. Uh, phenomenal conversation. I really enjoy the the shares. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, apologies for that, but hopefully, you, you know, you got some value, and I really enjoyed hearing the different perspectives. And um, yeah, let's have uh, have an awesome week. And um, yeah, thank you, Keegan, so much. Come Seriously, with your questions for next week. Yeah, th thanks, Brennan. Thanks, Jason. Everyone, yeah, that's yeah, good, yeah. good to see you on guys, Owen. If you can, get this yep. book. If you want yeah, to understand yeah. fascia and tension in the system, this is a great book. It's it's pretty dense, but dense. <laughs> it's yeah. dense. Jason's Jason's got a bigger brain than me. Oh, well, that one's that one's full on. Yeah. All right. I'm just thanks, guys. To, to, to increase my value, dude. 100%. And you are. <laughs> it's gold. Good man. All right. Chat soon. Bye-bye.